Welcome. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you guys Michael Hansmeier. Um, Michael, welcome back. You were here for these reviews. Um, I thought that some of the subject that is related to Michael's work, and I think we will find out more, it has to do with um, what I would argue is one of the most um, probably interesting byproducts that we have in the last 15 or 20 years since the uh, eruption of computers and technology into the domain of architecture in a very aggressive way. The reason why I think it's an interesting take and an interesting problem is because in many ways if we take the paradigmatic and dogmatic take of other love in relation to ornament and crime, as at the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, it's clear that uh, Loss at that time introduced what he, said, what he would call a sense of the immorality of ornament, describing as de degenerate uh, its suppression as necessary for regulating modern society. Uh, he doesn't seem like a fun guy to be around. Um, I love in, in many regards, but the truth of the matter in that particular time and context and the cultural and political, um, many of those statements were important and it were, it were, it were, they were peculiar because in many, many ways one could argue that there was a relation between the notion of ornament and the relation of, let's say, social value or social status. The more money you have, more ornament you will have able to have. Now, we know the story, it goes by, how it goes by with Adolf Loos and then Le Corbusier and many others through the modernism, the idea of authenticity and the idea of um, frugality or that the exterior and the interior are the same thing. Because also one of the other qualities of ornament was that the external, the public facade and the private facade they were different. They had di different levels of saturation. But one could argue, um, one could argue that one of the interesting byproducts, as I was saying at the beginning, um, have to do with the possibility that the new coherences, or I would call well, the notion of the immorality or the generate of perversions, now they're all legal and they're all accepted as part of what we do. So there is a kind of a possibility of the new coherences between a highly ornamented or articulated architecture language that at the same time it, it produced some sense of partial honesty or there is a certain kind of clarity in terms of the reading in parallel with the, let's say, the values of modernism, but at the same time it produces a certain level of aesthetic and oversaturation in the way that one can think more of the 19th century or previous takes of ornament. Now, if we really think about ornament and crime, we can have our version of the FBI most wanted criminals um, through different periods of history, and in the same way that the FBI, some of them are deceased, some of them are, are, are alive. Um, now, as we know, in our, these contemporary times, the idea between an honest person and a criminal one is a matter of degrees. And you can be a cool criminal, or you can be a very boring, honest person. So there is something about this that is really, really interesting. And the question is, is that question mark, and I think we can see their, their own work and so on, but the question is if Michael deserves to be among the most wanted criminals. And I think to me, this is at the key of the center of the conversation. And if you notice, you will, feel, you will see that I include Miss Van der Rohe as a criminal committed to ornament. And it's a longer discussion, and we can talk about another day, but I'm absolutely convinced that Miss was committed to an ornamental approach to architecture. Nevertheless, I want to leave you with this. I really think I'm curious to see about uh, in Michael will land, um, and he will claim his place among the most wanted criminals in relation to ornament, if we were willing to accept that ornament is crime, which I'm not so sure that we should. Michael Hansmeier. Thank you, Hernan, for the um, introduction of me as a potential criminal. 
Um, that's how I felt actually going through immigration yesterday, um, <laughs> where they kept me for a couple of hours. So um, I'll see if I can live up to that. Um, out, out of order, I think it's, it's, it is aptly named um, in the sense that it's four o'clock in the morning for me. So please, um, and I feel out of order, please bear with me if um, things are a little bit slow. Um, I was, as, as Hernan mentioned, I was here um, four weeks ago at, at the reviews, which were um, fantastic and, um, and, and very impressive. And in a way, just what I imagined um, that SIARC would be. And, at the, and I was very, very astounded because it, it was, there was so much digital virtuosity um, here. Yet, yet quite a few students seem to be looking actively in, in other directions. Um, some of my fellow critics concurred and then spoke of a digital backlash. So they were saying, after, after decades of hype, that's not all surprising. Um, but it raises the question, I think, um, one that we've been facing for a while. What is um, the relevancy of the digital for architecture? And I don't have any concrete answers for you. Um, I, I, what I can do is show a few projects and, and, and offer some thoughts along the way. Um, and these projects might provide a glimpse, not, not an exclusive one by any means, not a comprehensive one, of what um, advances in computation may bring and, and, and some of the issues they raise. So at the heart of the first project I'll show was the desire of mine to, to escape um, uh, references. So not to compose with, with idealized forms or components, not to rearrange or deconstruct them, to start with a white sheet of paper and, and specifically one without a grid system on it. Um, it's, there's not so many operations one can do. There's, there's, in, in architecture, we, we often add things together. Um, as I mentioned, we can, we can um, subtract them. I was looking for a, an operation or a process that was as, as open-ended and non-prescriptive non as possible. Um, and I looked at division. So it's, it's, it's essentially, I've, it's, it's a process that takes a surface and um, uh, recursively divides it. it. It takes a surface because volumes are more computationally um, expensive. So essentially envelopes. And you can, just by doing a simple operation, such as shifting the midpoint, you can already create a, a, a depth and breadth of output um, that, is, that is perhaps um, astounding. It's, it's um, permutations of a form that are unique, but they, they, they look like they belong to a single family. So one can take this into the computer um, and, and bring it into three dimensions. And, and doing so, um, we, we can not only do this sort of a folding much quicker than we would by hand, but we also suspend any sort of physical constraints. And we can use this sort of a process to create structures. The analog of a square I just showed is, is a cube. And by, by folding this a couple of times, eight times each surface to be precise, you end up with something like, like this. If you change the division ratios, that same cube turns into this or into this, or into this. It's, it's just the same process that I showed you. It's, it's a cube whose surfaces are divided into four. These surfaces are divided again and again and so on. But each form is essentially, and you can see it most clear to here, a cube. So it's ornamental, yes, perhaps, but it's, it's a minimal process. There's a, a, a simple input, a cube, and, and a very simple operation. And, and playing on this, one can locally differentiate the forms by applying different division ratios at, at different parts of the form to produce local conditions. And in this way, one can begin to, to, to assume control to sculpt, to sculpt the shape. It's, it's a virtual lab. In a way, it's, it's free of physical constraints, which is nice because we can do things that are, would be impossible in real life. So we can have impossibly small surfaces, um, the, the surfaces can self-intersect. Um, there's, there's no, no tearing of material. Um, or we can, we can introduce constraints. We can introduce a, a tearing um, if, if a, a surface becomes too big or torn apart. So we can, we can simulate certain, certain natural phenomena or, or play with them. 
And, and all these sorts of approaches simply expand the scope of forms that we can, we can produce. Is this parametric is, uh, is a question. And parametric is a loaded word um, these days. Um, in a way, yes, of course it's parametric. It involves parameters. But, but really, what, what doesn't involve parameters? Perhaps, perhaps it's not the best description of it. At, at this point, though it's a slippery slope, I would distinguish between parametric and procedural, not, not, not a black and white distinction, but different, different notions, I think. So in my understanding, parametric models are more about control of a form um, rather than exploration. They work within a finite prescribed scope um, instead of constructing an, an, an open solution space. So they're very useful for rationalization. Um, but essentially, I, I see the parametric as a constraint-based technique. Rules must be defined explicitly. The model is established beforehand. Um, and therefore, this implies a thinking in terms of categories. But I think this, this digital technology we have today um, gives us an opportunity to, to escape existing categories. Um, and, and I think that's where if we, we continue to think in procedures, um, it's, that's, that's an opportunity for us. To quote Whitehead, we have to be systematic, but we have to keep our, our systems open. Um, can computation work without rules and predefined models? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, there, I think it's, it's an opportunity, but, but potentially also a um, source of frustration. So I would argue that a procedural approach, and, and these are the projects that I will, sh will sh continue to show, um, expands the scope of forms far beyond what classical parametric systems are capable of by producing local conditions, multiple scales, um, complex curvatures. And my hope is that it, that it offers a possibility to stop being branded by the software that one is using. So, so people going and saying, ah, this is a Form Z project. OK, not really used anymore, but, but 20 years ago. Or that's a 3D Max one, or a Maya one. Or this one is clearly a grasshopper um, project. Um, more pessimistically, maybe, maybe one will say, OK, no, this is clearly a, a, a Java-based project. Um, I, I don't know. Um, it, it, it offers the um, possibility to, to easily incorporate multiple materials and so on. Is this all, or how could this all turn into architecture? Um, and at what scale? I, I look at a column initially, and I did so, I have to confess, out of purely pragmatic reasons. It seemed like the only architectural artifact that one, one could reasonably produce in terms of its scale and size, and still have it be read as architecture. Um, but it's also, of course, an interesting uh, typology in architecture, one which um, expressed technological and aesthetic views in the past, and which, um, for Greeks and Romans at least, was designed according to rules. So as Mario Carpo once pointed out to me, in Vitruvius' text, there, there were no drawings. It was purely a sequence of steps that were followed um, by artisans or by the builders to produce the columns. And they were then interpreted um, by these, by these um, builders. So um, this also a rule-based rule approach to design, which um, allows us to create information at multiple scales. The, the, fur, the closer one gets, the more new features one discovers. And um, if the computer were a bit stronger, we could continue the zoom in a little bit further. Um, but unlike traditional architecture, it's a single process, right, that, that creates both the overall form, the input form here is not a cube but a cylinder, and, um, and the surface detail. Um, the, I think resolution in and of itself may not be desirable, but I think what, what to me is interesting is when you have these, these multiple scales of, of details. Um, the possibility to use a process, rerun it, create many permutations. And it's, it's essentially, and this is the first column um, we built, it's essentially, I think of it as a design using synthetic particles. And whether these are voxels or, 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 or facets, um, at, at some point it doesn't really begin to matter anymore. 
um, due to their hyper-resolution, you, you begin to read it as, as something more continuous than, than its own little discrete element. Um, they're undrawable, I think, using conventional means. At least it would take you a long time to create all these sections and, 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 and elevations, um, whether with a pen or a mouse. It would take long. Um, the question is, are they, are they um, imaginable? And beforehand, to what extent does one know what it, one ends up with? It's, it's this question of authorship and, and control. The processes are deterministic. There's no randomness. This, uh, my wife always says it's like a, a rotating chicken getting skewered. Um, so, but did I know I was producing this rotating chicken? No, there's too many steps. So I, I, I can't say I knew what was going to happen right, right there. Um, it's, it's a new role for the architect. I think one that traditionally we've been uncomfortable with, though I have the feeling that here people aren't uncomfortable with it, where, where one loses exact control over an exact geometry, but perhaps assumes control over a broader sense of attributes. And you have surprise, which is um, both intentional and, and quite welcome. Um, but what we need is, I think, a new a new method to explore this entire possibility space that we have. It's, I always see it as, as a search not for a form, but a search for a search mechanism by with, with which one can explore the scope of forms of the process which one has opened. Mm. Going back to immigration yesterday, of course one gets photographed and fingerprinted, and the, the, the system behind that actually works um, with eigenvectors and eigenfaces. Um, essentially, they don't bother to describe a face like was classically done, the distance of your eyes is this far, or your nose is this long, or something like this. But, but if each face gets described as, as a blend of, um, of these proto-faces, so to say. So you can statistically describe each face as some combination of other faces out there of perhaps 20 or 30 or 40 um, sample faces. Um, and it's really the question of data versus a rule. This, this assumes there is no hard-coded rule. You just have a, a gigantic set of data which one can use to, to begin to compose things. Um, by, is this running? Let's see. Yes, slowly. So by changing the, the, the blending, you, you, you create new permutations of faces. Um, and this, for instance, could be one, one um, search mechanism um, to produce architectural form, I think. So we tried the same thing, a few prototypical, what would be a dome. Mm, let's see. Something is stuck. A few domes are loaded, are analyzed for the principal components and then can, can be blended and reconfigured into something that, if done at a higher resolution and a bit slower, could look like this or so on. And from there, one can go a step further and just begin to produce many and many, many variants of, of, of blended domes. Um, how, how to index them, how to map them, um, in, in, in this case, we, we, we took the Google software and simply created a gigantic Google Earth map and placed the domes in, in different locations so you can, you can essentially zoom through it and, 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 and into them um, as you'd like. It works in a web browser, too. So it's, it's the understanding of the machine, to me, as a laboratory. It's, it's um, where you can experiment, you can try out, you can explore, you can synthesize things. Um, you can cultivate many variants in parallel. Um, and use, for instance, evolutionary algorithms. Um, you can breed populations, work with generations, mutations. It's, it's the architect as a cultivator, as an, as an orchestrator. The, it's an architecture, I think, of action. Um, going back to the column, a, a few columns that were created over various permutations, um, where, where one literally took one and the other and had them have children and, and, and extracted um, a few desirable ones. The question is, what do we select for? This is something that the computers, it's very easy to get the computer to produce forms. It's very difficult to get them to select forms because how do you tell, what is one selecting for? Is it, is it 
beauty, however one defines it? Is it interestingness? Is it newness? Um, and, and how do we describe that to the, the computer? Um, I wish it were possible to describe it because then, you know, if it were producing and, and selecting forms, I could just have a very long nap and, and it would do all, all the work. But the, the, the selection part, I think, is a, is a lot more difficult. Um, I think the questions are linked, though. We, we can't know what we're selecting for without knowing the potential of the process, um, without exploring the space. Yet we can't explore the space without selecting. Hence, the what and the how in the digital are deeply intertwined. Um, and, and I think that's something that I'm going to come back to in a moment. So again, one, one can do this composition via queries or clusters. One, one can play with uncertainty. Um, and, and in doing so, end up with perhaps something that, that, that looks like this or, or um, like this. And these were made, these are columns that were made using this eigenface um, approach of the principal components that I just described. Into the world. Um, at, at some point, we, we, we wanted to produce, produce it and um, took this and the column and sliced it and came up with a section that looks like this. We were very surprised. This, this process of dividing and folding had actually continued inside of the column. There was a lot going on that we, we didn't see because we were using a software that always hid the, the inside from the outside. Um, but we, we got rid of the inside at least for the moment, um, to create a, a series of slices. This was back in 2011 or 10. And um, at that point, 3D printing isn't quite where it was, where it is today. So we had to produce this, and, and you will laugh at this, in a painstaking process of laser cutting, 2,700 <laughs> one millimeter thin cardboard <laughs> slices that we stacked on top of each other. Um, but I'm very proud to say it's, it's a photo, it's not a rendering. It looked quite a bit like the one we had on the computer. Um, which, and, and, and almost all of the details um, were preserved. And, and we even got many details that we didn't expect. And these are my favorite parts. You're now looking at the inside, so essentially the negative. It's a space of perhaps 60 centimeter diameter that you can go into with a, with a camera. Um, and you can see all these, these things that were burn marks from, from the laser cutter. Or just in general, is an aesthetic that, that's created by having this, this sort of a slicing. Um, so it was by, by bringing it into the real world, by, um, by um, on, on the one hand, it was, I think it was very useful initially to have the process be oblivious to the world outside. They had no scale to begin with. And, and the scale was essentially dictated by the budget and by the time we had. Um, access to the printer. There was no force analysis, no anticipation of burn marks, tearing edges, and so on. And it's, it's nice to have the sort of a purity, but I think we also, we, we missed an opportunity. Um, and I think it's, we could have done a feedback loop and brought some of these real world constraints into the design process and, and, and sort of closed the loop. Um, there was a, a, a huge discontinuity between the virtual and physical. Um, as, as you can see, what took 35 seconds to calculate took 200 hours to um, produce. And um, it turned out to be absolutely unscalable. We, we tried to produce one of the domes that I showed earlier and then make it three or four meters big using this sort of a slicing technology. It failed, it failed miserably. It, 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 there were shear forces and it, it just collapsed and began to sag and hang and I don't even have any pictures of it. Um, <laughs> But, um, so yeah, we can, we can use form, we can use code to write form. And a question that interests me also is how it is read and interpreted. Um, the short answer, I think, is with people's fingers. It's, it's, I'm always astounded that people um, touch um, all the models. We, we put up signs saying, please don't touch, but everybody touches them. And then after a while, we just, we just um, remove the signs. It's, so it's, it's, it's nice that, that it, I think it elicits this kind of a reaction. Um, 
how are they interpreted? And it's, they're, they're rarely described in terms of their, their geometry, I think, and it's usually figurative descriptions. So it's either natural connotations um, or some sort of animalistic ones. Um, why is this so? Is this because the process mirrors natural processes, namely subdivision um, of surface and cell division? I've, I've drawn that analogy in the past, but with the benefit of hindsight, I think it's a facile comparison. Um, the subdivision process itself is at best a caricature of reality. I'm, I'm, I'm not a biologist. I have far too little understanding of what is actually happening in cell division. But, but from my understanding, there's a lot of information embedded in these cells, whereas there's very little in the surfaces. So I think rather than finding out about how this process links to nature, perhaps the more interesting thing is to explore what is in, in the nature of a process such as this one. Um, more and more, I think these natural interpretations that we have relate to our history. Um, our means of production since the Industrial Revolution um, have, have gone in a very certain direction and have favored simple objects, smooth surfaces, at one scale, often without much detail. Non-standard curvatures have until recently been difficult to produce. And I think this, this mass fabrication has influenced our understanding of what we think man-made or the unnatural means and what it looks like. Um, I would argue the columns nonetheless have some order. It's, it's, um, it's possible to distinguish it from chaos, yet nonetheless the rules behind it are perhaps not easy to deduce. It, it can't be um, explained through reductionism, and, and perhaps that's what elicits a curiosity. Perhaps that could be one of the potentials of the digital. And this is, I admit, it's a, process, a project purely driven by, by technology, by the how. It's, it's embracing one of the tools of our times, computation, and exploring its potential. Um, for a lot of people, the idea of a technologically driven design is, is controversial, it's undesirable. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see it as such. I think uh, it, it, it always, our architectural design has always been technologically driven, as it has always been one of the key drivers, whether you go back to concrete and, and what happened in terms of skyscrapers or free surfaces or glass paneling um, leading to all the facades we see today and so on. Um, must we use this technology? Of course not. But, but I'd argue we'd, we wouldn't be human if we wouldn't be curious and, um, and, and we wouldn't want to explore. Um, and it's not an either or. It's not, um, yeah. Let me, let me go back. Let me, ask, let me also go to Mario Capo's point earlier about Vitruvius bringing back, which goes back to the question of authorship. I think um, the, in, in, in the case of Vitruvius, the craftsmen were, to some extent, the author of the columns because they were interpreting um, the instructions given to them. In, in the computer's case, this was essentially randomness, creating permutations. Um, does this mean that one was forfeiting authorship? Or was I still an author being the one that, that, that wrote the program? I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's an open discussion. Um, it relates to, to this argument by Rushkoff of program or be programmed. And in, by, by the architect simply selecting, one could argue that, that we, we're simply the agents um, which are shining a light onto the possibility of the space of the software that we've either written or that has been, that we're using, that has been given to us. Um, if one believes that, I think then, then the solution, one of the solutions could lie in trying to better understand the tools that we're using. Um, not just what they enable, but also how, how they work. So while one solution could be to write one's own scripts or program or even create one's own software packages, I, I don't think that's the only answer. I think um, instead we can turn to just a, a, a more confident use of, of these tools to hybridize them, to add different um, processes to them, and not to always take their output as final. Um, we, can, we can mix and combine and, and, and create a sort of authorship in, in that manner. Um, I think with, with at least as impressive results as if we um, decide on a purest solution of, of programming. Um, 
The second project I'll show is a, a grotto. A friend of mine, Benjamin Dillenberger, and I received a commission to create a grotto for an architecture exhibition at Frac Centre in France called Naturalizing Architecture. And um, they saw these procedural approaches as, as somewhere between man-made and natural and believed that a grotto had historically exemplified this, this dialect. So they were often in nature but very much man-made environments or they were man-made environments meant to look natural. Um, the only condition had was that it should be made procedurally, ideally fabricated digitally, and be at a human scale so one can walk inside. And we, in, in wondering how to do this, we stumbled upon um, this massive machine. You can, you can get a sense of the scale by looking at the door. It's a, it's a very big 3D printer, four by two by one meter print volume. Um, so 13 ton pieces at once yet as, at a resolution of um, a seventh of a millimeter. And, and this machine does not care what it prints. You pay by bounding box. So the, the most elaborate form costs as much as printing a simple cube. It's the same time and the same cost. And, and that's a radical change. And to, to go back to Hernan's point, is, is ornament still a crime if there's no more this, this, this social connotation um, linked to it, if it's no more, if, if printing a straight wall costs the exact same amount as an articulated one. Um, so it's, one has 4.2 terabytes of print space, 33 trillion grains of sand in there. And the question is, which one do we glue? There is, there's no, there's no logic to give us any guidance. There's no cost constraints to give us any, any, any guidance. We can literally control for each one's distinctly, okay, you get glued, the next one next to you um, doesn't. And, and this, this reminds me very much of this match. I don't think there's any question about it. Will computers ever be able to work out what nine 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 n
um, a space of discovery, um, and, but, but the idea that one has to move through the space in order to perceive it. This is how we naively imagined um, the surface detail. And this was my wish to have everything in gold. Um, this is actually, they're once again surfaces. In this case, you're looking at it transformed into um, three dimensions, into, into um, voxels. Um, but, but the idea of a reevaluation, perhaps, of, of ornament. Um, the first print tests. And I mentioned that you can have an unlimited differentiation within the shape, but you can have the same amount of differentiation between, between the different shapes one prints. So there's no um, economies of scale whatsoever with this process. Mm -hmm. So you can have 100% individualization at, at no ex extra cost to manufacturing. So what, what kind of a process could be better suited to, to taking advantage of this than than computation, um, than a computational one. I, I, I think computation is predestined for something such as this. Um, there's, so there's, there's no pressure in this case to, to really settle on a, a common denominator. And I think with that, modernity's arguments, rational arguments for standardization um, are losing their ground. We, we saw this printer, the first test prints, and we became more confident with a larger plan. Um, and the idea was to entirely 3D print the form. So, so not to put the, to have massive components, or at least partially hollowed out ones, um, but not to put a surface onto a substructure, but to actually have surface and substructure. So similar to wood in a way, which is also very strong, but can be very highly detailed. Um, 16 square meters, that's about 170 square feet, I think, um, 3.2 meters high. And we had no idea at that point what it would weigh. Um, we knew, however, that even though we could essentially print the two sides in two or four pieces, it would be impossible to transport them because the um, exhibition space didn't have a crane that was big enough to, to set them up. Um, so we had to make it out of, out of um, individual elements that could be more, more easily transported. And then began play. Um, and, and it really was play. Um, it was, I think, about using these algorithms in, in the most intuitive way or speculative way possible. possible. Um, it wasn't about efficiency at all or function. We were completely free of that. And, and it, was, um, it was something that, that we we're all doing, I think. It's, it's a design completely in three dimensions. So no longer using plan or sections or elevations. Um, as a matter of fact, we, we could render it, or, but that wouldn't even have been necessary. Um, so it's more like a sculptural approach than, than, than a graphical one. It's unlike with the columns, it's a fabrication without adaptation. It's literally what you see is what you get. That was all, once again, the analogy to the 2D, that was all the rage in desktop publishing 30 years ago. And I think we're, we're at the, the, the idea that what's on your Mac is gonna be what's on your paper. And, um, and I think we're at this point now, or starting to reach this point now in, um, in 3D printing. Unfortunately, not for the surface quality yet. Um, and as I mentioned, a, a, a fusion of, of structure and surface. So the idea that one doesn't have different subsystems for the structural part and the um, surface. So once again, the, 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 this the idea of the natural versus the man-made of chaos versus order, between foreign and familiar, between the expected and surprise. Um, a, a plan or a, a section cut similar to the column, where you can see some of the details um, in the form, and another one. And we built a prototype to test it. Here it is. Um, this is without. Um, a resin coated coating added to it, just as it comes out of the printer. This one is roughly a meter twenty or so high, so it's just the sand right now, and the binder. And then began a series of very cumbersome coating tests. Um, first, we started with real gold. Then we realized that was expensive and quickly moved on to fake gold. <laughs> then we realized that was time consuming and moved on to spray painting. So, yeah. 
Um, and here are some details. The, they're, they're roughly the size of my hand. So, so it's the idea really that you can, you have details at multiple resolutions. You have to get very close with your eye, or in this case with a camera, and you will, you will um, hopefully discover something that you didn't see from a, me a meter away, which is arguably different than this, this wall. Um, the light passing through it. The surface was the surface gave us a really hard time because of the sandstone is, is very porous and all the paint we put on top of it just got absorbed. Um, a guy sitting behind me said I should see a, a um, church, a restorer of churches, um, because they these in Switzerland where I was teaching and, and making this are, are traditionally made of sandstone. Um, and they would have experience with the paint. So I drove into the part of Switzerland where they, they speak four languages in Switzerland, and one is called Rätoromanisch. It's, it's spoken by not even 30,000 people. It was difficult to communicate with this guy, but what I was understanding in terms of what to, how to paint it was Haas, which was cheese. And I always thought there's a misinterpretation going on here, but no. Traditionally, these sandstone churches um, in Switzerland are painted with a cheese, a lactose cheese sort of a paint. And um, we use this. This is what you see here, actually. And it, it worked perfectly. It, it created a very smooth, consistent surface. Um, it's, it's cheese with pigments, is what you're looking at. The problem with cheese is it's almost as expensive with, as gold. So <laughs> we, had to, we had to move away from that also. So. Um, briefly, I will show you how we printed it. It's, it's just a minute long, bear with me. like one is um, like an excavation site of a fossil essentially you take this thing out um, this was a small printer they have the big one you can imagine is significantly larger and then begins a very cumbersome process of cleaning it um, which is ironic that one has such a high-tech production thing and then one is there with this little vacuum cleaner kind of a thing now they have actually built a very large vacuum cleaner to do it which which works um, much better. But at that point, they didn't have it. The painting. The test set up on a very unsmooth surface, so you're still seeing large joints between the thing, which looked a little bit better when we had finally set it up. Do you have a space that, that you can walk, essentially walk into? And these are heavy pieces. They're about 200 kilos each. So we were, we were quite scared setting it up. few more photos. It's, um, so I think we have a return to depth in architecture. We have a return of, of shadow. Um, and some more. It's, it's, and the, the process behind this is the exact same one that I, um, the same operation that I showed initially. It's a division of a surface, specifically a cube. You can see it a little bit here. Exterior, which is simply cut. So it's, one starts with a cube, which is just cut open in the middle, and you're looking at the inside 
as opposed to as opposed to looking at the outside of it. This is this is the folding that takes place on the inside. The form then gets gets projected onto this outside skin, set up with a crane or um, a forklift. And the detail, we actually had this butterfly land on it. This is not Photoshop. Um, and um, there's, again, a big disconnect between the virtual and the physical. But you'll notice it's getting shorter. Um, it took about a month to print and a day to set up. If this um, printer had been working on only our project rather than printing car parts, which is what it usually does, um, it would have taken perhaps three or four days to print this. This printer is actually used, it's interesting, to, to create not the end products, but to create um, parts for molding. Um, so usually the, the forms are destroyed after the mold has been, been created. I think this is, we decided to use it to, to create an end product, which was something um, new for, for the company. So, yeah, what, what can we use this technology for? It's, it's, I think, something that addresses not only the mind, but, but arguably the senses in a, in a vis visceral way. Um, and an intellectual and, a, for lack of a better word, a phenomenological endeavor. I know that this is, a, 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 in many cases, a, a, a bad word, um, phenomena. But I think it's, it's something we have to embrace, or at least that I'm interested in embracing. Um, because we can, we can use processes such as this to create something that, that I think will, can hopefully defy classification and, and elicit individual interpretations. Um, something where, where something that is exceptional supersedes something um, standard. And, and with these ideas, Benjamin and I um, took part in the PS1 competition last year. Um, historically, they've chosen projects that emphasize sustainability issues, um, urban gardening, organic materials, and so on. And, and while these aren't without a doubt important, um, we, we didn't think that architecture should be limited to an exercise in this. Um, we um, presented a project I will show to you that is called Phenomena. The music is a bit dated. So the idea to increase the scale, we try to entice them with giraffes. A sort of a, a, a fountain sculpture for their somewhat minimalist courtyard. That doubles as a stage. But we lost. Um, we lost to, to um, André Jacques, who presented a large water purifier. Um, where, where are we now? Um, if we subscribe to the idea that, that of a continu continuous future development in computational design and fabrication, then I think the days of architects running up against limitations of computers are over. I think it's, it's solved. Um, computers can now do architecture, just like they can do video or um, other things that were previously um, unimaginable. They can do architecture at a specificity and scale that, that's on the level of our, 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 our perception. Um, so, so what do we do with it? There's, there's less restrictions. There's an almost terrifying degree of freedom if you, if you look at this 3D printer. Um, and we have, we have far fewer restraints, whether geometrical um, or in terms of costs or in terms of um, the criminal social connotations um, that we can rely on and that can give us guidance for our design. Um, with so much new, newness suddenly conceivable, I think, to, to me it seems it's, it's time to return um, and, and reconsider um, the why and the what. We've, we've been in this bubble where it's been a lot about the how 
And it's great that we've been in this bubble because it's allowed us to develop these techniques, to perfect them to, to a virtuosity that, that I've seen here, um, which, is, which is highly impressive. But um, I think it's, it's now, it might be the time to bring in some of the things that I've been seeing here in the final reviews. And that's been a, a rediscovery in, in the interest in making, in, in a few projects at least, in the beauty of drawing, in the necessity of the social, um, in the pluralism of postmodernity, um, and we, I think these these trajectories are all valid. And I think the question really is how to how to integrate them with our digital, um, how they how they speak to each other, inform each other, in order to establish a more comprehensive idea of architecture. We need to hybridize these processes. It's it's no small task, of course. Um, I, I I have. Zero answers for you, I apologize, but I, I will leave you with this quote um, from Louis Kahn in 1971. He said to his class of students, you say to a brick, what do you want, brick? And the brick says to you, I, I like an arch. If you say to the brick, arches are expensive, I can use a concrete lintel over an opening, what do you think of that brick? Brick says, I like an arch. So in other words, it's in the nature of the brick to form an arch. Um, perhaps the question for us today is, what would a grain of sand or a computational particle want to be? And I will um, leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs>